that you're taking yourself, not just believing, because people believe, but they never step into, not just talking about it, but they actually do it, that they step into faith. A few things I wrote down. The world wants to, and I've really been pondering this just because of everything going on. The world wants to inflict fear into a person's life. And if you look at the things that are going on around us, it is very easy, easy if you look with the natural eye, that you can become fearful. God, on the other hand, because if you got the enemy, you got God. If you got God, you got the enemy. That's how it works. You're, you, it's either, one or other. People are like, oh, no, no. No, it's one or the other. You're serving one or the other. You're serving one or the other. God, on the other hand, is different. He desires to build, and hear me, build faith in every believer so that even when things are actually scary and unsettling, your faith in Christ will sustain and strengthen you. Folks, you're not going to be away from all the fear and anxiety of this world until you either take your last breath and you walk into the gates of heaven or, or you're raptured before uh, when the trumpet sounds. We're constantly going to be surrounded by what is going on. I know the Kingdom Now theology disagrees with that. The Kingdom Now theology is screaming about, oh, no, no, we can call God's kingdom down. God's kingdom is going to take take root here on the earth and it's going to change it and Jesus will be, once we get the earth ready then Jesus is going to come back hooey that's a scriptural word or biblical or the theological word hooey garbaggio it's not true that's not the way these things are going to happen the bible says they will happen why because the world is going through birthing pains but the fact is you don't have to be infilled with fear but when you infill your heart with faith, taking that step, going across the line, not just walking up to it, not just talking about it, not even just believing in it, but when you step into faith, then all of a sudden your life will be different. Then you'll know, no matter what goes on around you, that your life is truly built on that rock, not upon sinking sand. Scripture says that any man that builds his house upon the rock will stand. Any person that builds their house upon the sand will do what? Sink. So where's your house? I want to remind, and I reminded myself about this from the very first week of what we looked at and what faith is not. Faith is not convenient. Faith, remember, convenience is whatever, whatever is done is done to make your life easier. Faith is just the opposite of that. Faith is not convenient. Faith isn't there to make your life easier. Faith is to make your life, hear me, stronger. Stronger. Not easier stronger. People get confused about that. Well, no, I, I think God should make... No, God doesn't care what you think or what I think. Faith makes a person stronger. So, none of this can occur. None of this, as far as you having faith and stepping into it, none of this can happen to us unless we purposely step into faith. We step over the line. We have, there, there's a song we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I've decided. No turning back. How true. When you get that determined and say, that, no, that's it, that's it, that's it. I'm, this, this is what I've determined in my heart. Then you'll step into faith. It's that wishy-washy thing. That like, oh, I kind of do, I kind of don't want to. I don't know, yeah. Well. No, no. When you've decided, when you've decided in your heart that your life needs faith and your relationship with Christ more than breath itself, then you will be stepping into faith. But until you get to that place, you're just, nah, you're just walking up that line. You're boy, ah, boy, that looks good. Again, you can go to Hebrews chapter 11, I believe. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 11, chapter on faith. Read, read cha Hebrews chapter 11, just read it. Take some time today, just read Hebrews 11, where it talks about all the, uh, all, all the people in the Bible that took steps of faith. That took real courage. That took real determination. That wasn't like haphazardly. They're like, I'm all in, I'm going to do it. When Moses was spoken to by the burning bush, and he went back to Egypt where they wanted to kill him. He went back determined that no matter what happened, he was going back. Why? Because he was going to confront Pharaoh. Why? Because God told him to. He had to go in faith, believing God to sustain him, walking back into the lion's den, basically, and standing before Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. 
And Yul Brenner goes, no. <laughs> We've been looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, so you can turn your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And again, I hope you've been reading ahead, but we're, we're, that's where we're at, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We looked at verses 10 and 11, and I'm going to read those to you real quickly. And it says this, but now here we are, men from Ammon. You would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of our possession. You gave us as an inheritance. Verse number 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's determination. That's determining in their heart that God was the ultimate source. We're going to look at a little bit more of that today. And then I went on to the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Where Paul says that they are paraded at the end of the parade, they are at the end of the parade. Basically, they're on display. They're on display as prisoners for the cross. They are going to be sacrificed. They're going to be martyred. That's what the apostles are. But they are on display. And see, that's an example. We have to understand that because right there, when they said, "We don't know what to do, but we're here, and our eyes are fixed on you," and then the apostle Paul talks about that our lives are on display. And I, and I went on to say that our life is an example to others. And that's very true. I asked last week if people around you know that you're a Christian. If you walked up to somebody and said, do you think I'm a Christian? I'd love to hear what they have to say. I'd love to hear what people have. I've asked people or people told me, I know you're a Christian. How do you know? Well, they tell me. But what do they know? Or are you keeping it quiet? You shouldn't keep your faith quiet. Why should you keep... I'm not talking to get a, mic, uh, a bullhorn and go stand on a corner and start screaming at people. That, I'm sorry. I'm not a big street person guy. I, I believe in you live it every day. Lifestyle evangelism, that's what I believe in. Where your life is just a display every day to the people you come in contact with. You help somebody out. You talk to them. You, you say, God bless you. Praying for you. Somebody sneezes, you say, oh, God bless you. Even now, people get freaked out by what? Well, you know, you could die. That's why when you sneeze, that's why we say that. That kind of just opens up the whole conversation. <laughs> what Paul is talking about, though, is being an example. It's not just a person who has natural determination. I watch some guys on YouTube and stuff that, that, that I don't know if they have a relationship with Christ. But I tell you what, they inspire me because they have a natural determination inside of them. You ever met somebody like that? They're naturally determined. That they're just going to go for it. It doesn't matter. They're just, I love that. I love that mentality. I've always been about that. As an athlete, I've always been about that. People will say, and even somebody very close to me that, whose name will go on said, honey. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, they, they just don't really understand it sometimes. Why, why are you that? I just love being determined. Okay? But I'm going to be honest with you. In your faith, you got to be determined, but in your faith, you got to be determined of heart. That you want God more than anything else in your life. When you get that determined, see, that's when you'll start to walk in faith. Yeah, but I'm not a very determined person. Nah, nah, see, you got to separate it. I watch guys that are very determined in worldly things, in discipline and all other things. But I also know, according to the Word of God, that there are people that who were not very determined in life, who were not big shots in life, but yet God used them in a miraculous way. Why and how? Because they were determined to follow God. That's faith. That's faith. So what it is about a rather person who walks by faith in an unseen God. So you walk by faith in an unseen God, but you know from the, who guides your steps. The Word of God says in the Old Testament, my word is a lamp unto your feet, a light under your path. He shines his light through his word on our path, where we're to go, how we're to go, what, what we're to do. He's laying it all out there for us. We have to take steps believing in God that we will walk according to his faith and his plan. All of us, all of this, I should say, keeps this, and this is a key to faith, keeps us dependent upon the Lord and not dependent upon upon ourselves. The Church of Jesus Christ in the United States today is very dependent upon themselves. They have figured out ways to, to bypass God, yet still have God in the picture, but yet really not as the main source of their strength or power. They've learned to manipulate, they've learned to, 
to uh, evaluate. They've learned to have this and that and these things to make things the best. I'm going to tell you something about the firehouse. We will always preach the word of God. We will always preach the word of God whether you like it, whether I like it or not. Not going to be hand puppets. There's not going to be lights and shadows and smoke and stuff. and none. No. The word of God. The word of God will be preached without apology, with power, not by... Listen, I, I see a trend, and it's been going on for years, where there's a lot of preachers and teachers of the word that want to dazzle people. And people want you to walk out going, wow, you, they dazzled me. Now, I think I can get an amen from this. I don't dazzle you. <laughs> right? I, I don't, I'm not a dazzler. You know what I'm saying? I don't even have good show hands. You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't dazzle. I, and I don't like dazzling. I, you know, whole dazzling. What, what is a dazzling? I know, dazzling is taking your eyes off of what's real to something that's not. Remember back in the day, what was it called? Glamour shots. <laughs> now, I'm not, don't, I'm not making eye contact with any ladies if you had glamour shots. Or some men. <laughs> Remember, that was like in the 80s. You had glamour shots. Then you put those pictures up in your house. What? I would walk into house, people's houses. I'd be like, who's that? And then I was just dumb enough before my wife could say, shut your mouth. I was dumb enough to go to the lady. Who, who, is that, who's that? Is that your sister? Is that your? Because they look nothing alike. That was a real big hair poofed up. How about it? <laughs> Glamour shots. What do they look like at five in the morning? <laughs> Guys, if you're not married, let me tell you something. You're dating a girl, take her swimming. Take her swimming. No, I mean with a one-piece bathing suit on. No, no teeny weeny little bikini things. One piece. You get gym shorts and a black t-shirt, it's fine too. Take them swimming. And make sure they're not wearing waterproof makeup. Because if they come out looking the same way they went in, there's a problem. There's a problem. And ladies, look at the guy's dad. Oh yeah. You know that beautiful head of hair that guy has right now? Look at the dad. Look at the dad. If they're bouncing radio signals off the top of his head because it's so bald and bouncing up to another satellite, that's going to be your husband. Now, if all that dazzle stuff is all taken away and you still are madly in love with that individual, that's the person for you. But if you need a glamour shot, you're marrying a facade. And that's the same way it is here. The word of God is true whether we like it or not. The word of God speaks to our heart whether we like it or not. And if we do like it, it's going to change us. But you've got to receive it in faith. Now, all of this, like I said, keeps us as believers dependent upon God. 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 13. You're like, all he's doing is just going verse by verse. Yeah, I know. <laughs> verse number 13 says this. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood before the Lord. They all came. They all came to hear what was going to happen. Moms, dads, kids. Grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles. They all came. <laughs> To stand where? Before the Lord. Family involvement is beyond important. In today's world, family involvement is beyond important. It's always, to Chir and I, it's always been the utmost importance. But you're like, well, you're, you're pastors. You had to come. No, no, no. no. And, and if you know me, you'll understand. We, we don't take that title as pastor like we got to pretend to be somebody that we're not. If we were parents not being pastors, 
our kids would have been in church. And there were times that our children would at times go, I don't want to go to church. And there was times that we were like, I don't want to go to church. But guess what? It's important. So get your rear end out of bed, even if you're talking to yourself, and go to church. Well, say, are, is church the answer? Church is part of the equation for the answer. You hear me? COVID has really knocked that in the teeth. I mean, it was on shaky ground to start out with, according to all the different statistics and interviews and all that stuff. Church attendance across the United States, across all Protestant and, and Catholic denominations is decline. COVID kicked it right in the teeth. Gave people a reason and excuse not to gather. You know the story. He goes, oh, you're going to get COVID. And, 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 and people to this day then have gotten in the habit that they don't need church. I'm going to tell you right now, you need church. Your kids need church. Your kids need church. And when they're old enough, they can come in here and I'll have another opportunity to have a part in twisting and demanding the mind of a young child. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, this, according to the word, we'll go back to verse number 13. All the men of Judah with all their wives and their children came and stood before the Lord. This is of utmost importance that you understand, that we understand this. That according to God's word, he's showing us the importance of what needs to be done with a family. And when I was putting this together this week, I had a lot of time to pray and stuff. And I was like, man, God, what are you trying to do? Because I got hung up on that passage because I was like, ah, we could just read on because, you know, then you go to verse number 14, which I don't know if I'll get to today. But you, 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 I wanted to get to verse number 14, but I really got hung up on this verse 13 because it had, again, having some time this week, I just was able to, to, to really pray on this. And then Megan, she's not here today, and she'll be watching, they're out of town, but she sent me a picture. I, I'm not on any social media. Uh, so don't look for me on social media. I'm not on it. But she sent me a picture that I guess Chira said it's been passed around on social media. And I, 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 she sent it to me on Thursday. Megan sent it to me on Thursday. She said, hey, P.S., I think you'd like this. And, um, and I did. In fact, I put it in my sermon today. That's how much I liked it. Uh, it's a sign. I'm assuming it's out in front of a church. I don't know, but it's a, just a sign. And there's a little awning over it. Nice little garden. I like the plants there. And it says this. There is, and I, I've preached this for so long. People left the church because I preached this. I really don't care. Because I don't care. Because I'd rather care enough to tell them the truth than tell them, ah, you're okay. Don't worry about it. And watch their family go to hell. Now, that may be a little blunt. But again, I'm not here to impress. And all God's people said. Amen. There is a 0.029% 96% chance that your child will become a professional athlete. There is a 100% chance that your child will stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read it to you again. Your kid, you know, Johnny or Susie, Susie Sue, whatever their name is. They're out there. They're dominating in the five-year-old soccer. They're going to states. <laughs> So let's go sell cookies out in front of Walgreens because our kids are going to state. Please. Your kid's out in the middle of the field going, uh. <laughs> why am I going to help pay for your kid to go to some state function where they're, because uh. that's what a five-year-old kid does. Oh no, my kid's 13. They're going to states. Again, please, please. Everybody gets a trophy. I, see, as an athlete, I can say this. I don't believe everybody should get a trophy. No stinking way. I'm going to speak out of my flesh for a minute. When I'm kicking my rear end day in and day out to the point where I can't lift my hands to brush my teeth because my shoulders are so sore and inflamed from swimming 15,000 yards a day, wearing a 10-pound weight belt on my back, and some kid... Who decides, eh, I want to save space. 
and I just want to swim and I'll finish dead last like 48 seconds behind him. I'll get a trophy too. No, you're a moron and a slacker. <laughs> I'm serious. Not every kid should get a trophy. Some kids stink at athletics. But some kid may be really good in algebra. See what I'm saying? Find what you're strong in. So I don't know, let me get back to this. <laughs> 0 0.0296 percent chance that your child will become a professional athlete. There is a 100 percent chance that your child is going to stand before Jesus Christ. I can't read over this passage, verse number 13, without realizing the absolute importance of family and faith. I just can't. Cher and I raised our kids in faith. Our kids saw us take steps of faith. Now what our kids do with that afterwards when they're older, that's on them. Because I've had parents say, I did all these things and look at what my kids did. It's not your fault. It's your fault if you didn't do it. See, and I've had parents say, my kids are resentful to me because they made me go to church. I'd say, smack them in the head and tell them to get out of your house. That's what I'd say to them. Because if that's their decision, then that's their decision. Don't hit them with anything that it's, goes beyond simple battery. See what I'm saying? Tell them to get out of your house. Yeah, but they're my kid. Okay. Well, if they're in your house, it's your house, by the way, parents. It's your house. We worked with adolescents for a long, long time. The worst thing a parent ever does is stop making a kid go to church. Worst thing ever. Worst thing ever. You know why they stop? They don't want the hassle. I just don't want the hassle. Then you shouldn't have had sex. I said that to parents. You shouldn't have, you know. I said the word, didn't I? <laughs> There's no little ones in here. Then you shouldn't have fooled around. Do the crime. Do the time. Just saying. So, here, we're, and parents, and, and this is where it's kind of, I got stuck at. Parents, where Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9, that his life, the apostle's life was on display. What are you and I to our kids? We are on display to our children. We're on display. You have to understand that. What's important to us, our kids will know. Church is important, our kids will know it. Why? Because Sundays you go to church. I'm really getting a little torqued. I got to find out more information, but you know, we're in high school graduation right now. Some of the kids are graduating today. Congratulations. I graduated once. Not from eighth grade either. But I'm hearing there's a few schools that are going to have graduation on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Now, I'm just hearing that. And if I find out that's true, I'm calling the superintendent of schools. Say, yo! I never throw out the title reverend. But I'm going to throw it out. Say, this, this is wrong. You may not need to see me at church. I may be protesting at the graduation, holding a big sign. Shouldn't be here. She'd be in church. <laughs> Seriously, what, what gives them the right? I, I don't want to take off on this, but what gives them the right to do that? Oh, Sunday, it's, just, it's going to be nice. And that's God's fault how? So you decide to take a Sunday? When people should be in church, and how my parents will go, but pastor, it's their graduation. We have to go, it's their graduation. Oh, See, here's where I, you know, that's why I probably don't be, do parent nights anymore. Be like, wait a minute. So you're going to look at your kid and go, oh, okay, you're graduating. So I'm going to skip church and go to your graduation. No. No, I wouldn't do it. I'd say no. We have church. Well, that's pretty radical. You know what? I'm so tired of people 
soft selling the gospel. Like it's not the word of God, it's a word of suggestions. I, it really, it's really starting to torque me. Can you tell? That, no, no, it's not important. It is important. And, and your kids are seeing whatever you're displaying, your kids are going to grow in that. You're on display. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect parent. It doesn't mean you're ever going to have to kid look at your kids and go, I'm sorry, your mom was wrong. <laughs> There's going to be those times where you say stuff like that, but the important thing is, <clears throat> is that you display to them. You put in their lives what's important. Right here, this was important for the nation of Israel to come together because the enemy was at the door. And you can look at that, <clears throat> excuse me, you can look at that as in the secular, that the world around us, the COVID and inflation and wars and famine and shortages. And you can look at that, but you can also look beyond that and see the real enemy behind it all. And that's Satan who has come to rob, kill and destroy. And when you start to compromise, when you start to even crack open that door, the enemy, it says, will come rushing in like a flood. And he will overtake you. He will overtake your family. He will overtake your loved ones. Because we're more interested in pleasing ourselves, having a convenient faith, rather than having a faith that makes us cross the line. Children, believe it or not, are designed to be led until they can reason on their own. And what parents you're doing is you're laying the groundwork for them to make right, healthy, godly decisions in their life. Again, what they do with it is on them. But what we do and what you're doing now, that's what's important. You know, there's a lot going on and, and, and kids need to see faith. They need to see parents standing in faith. They need to see parents who pray. They need to see parents who share the word of God. We talk about it all the time. We had devotionals every night together. My wife would do the devotionals at the kitchen table. She would read out of the Oswald Chambers, my utmost for the highest. The kids would all look at me. I'd be going, Aah. but we all listened. And then every night, every one of our kids, I would go in and I would tuck them in, even through high school. And I would pray with every one of our kids. That was our thing. She would do the devotional and I'd go pray with the kids at night. I didn't care. I didn't care how old they were. I didn't care if they were right in their minds, right with God. It didn't matter. We were going to have devotionals. And if any kid came to eat, and a lot of kids did come to eat at our house, they sat right at that kitchen table. They had dinner. Then we had devotionals. And if we looked like we we're going to skip, they would sometimes, aren't we having devotionals tonight? And if they were staying overnight, guess who got prayed for every night? Some of those kids would show up on Friday, wouldn't leave till Sunday night. I'm like, well, what's going on? Why can't I get their social security numbers? <laughs> I need to be able to deduct them on my income tax. But folks, I'm telling you, when they brought everybody together, think of that. When they brought everybody together, families, they came to seek after God. Society today is so anti that. Society today is so against that being your source. They want your source to be democratic, republican, independent, libertarian. They want your source to be man. They want your source to be something that you look for as it's going to bring you comfort. Nothing's going to bring you comfort like Jesus Christ will. Nothing. Amen. Nothing's going to bring you hope like Jesus Christ can. Nothing. Nothing's going to encourage you like Jesus Christ and his word can. Nothing. Because anything man does is an empty promise. Until it benefits them, it's an empty promise. God's promises stand true. They've stood the test of time. They never falter. They never fail. Why? Because they're God's promises. And they are based on God, who has no beginning and no end, and never will. And because He is forever and ever, there is nothing greater 
There is nothing greater to swear upon, the scripture says, than for him to swear upon himself. You know, like people say, I swear on my mother's grave. Well, my mom's not in the grave, she's in the attic, but, I, I, but I'm just... <laughs> but people say, I swear on, I, you know, where they put their hand about, I swear on the Bible. Really? You do? Yeah, let's see how well you lie on that one. See, we can all swear on something. But when God swore to hold it, uphold his word, he swore upon his own character, his own nature, his own being. That can't be undone. Not at all. In fact, what well, the scripture says, and I say this in weddings all the time, that when you make a vow to your spouse, it's better to have never made a vow than to make a vow and to break it. The Bible says that. God made a vow to man. And he will never violate that vow. His vow is that he'll, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That his word will remain true. That he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He'll stick to you closer than a brother. He is there for you in times of trouble. He has promised you eternal life. He has said to you, no man perish, but ever, for God desires for no man to perish, but for all men to have everlasting life. These are promises. These are vows that God has made to man. And we can't receive, look at me, we can't receive those until we take a step across the line in faith. And take hold of them. I couldn't take hold of my wife until I said, I do. And then I took hold of her. She was mine. Took her a few days to get, to get that concept, but. <laughs> I just don't remember. All she kept doing was going, oh. She came around six, seven years later. And you're laughing because you know it's true. I tell her all the time. She goes, why are you an idiot? I go, you married me like this. Who's the bigger idiot? I wouldn't have married me. Right? How many of us guys understand that? Healy, right? And your wife goes, why are you an idiot? I don't know. I've always been an idiot. But you married me. So, uh, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> That's completely off target. Uh, but listen, we're going we're gonna to wrap up for now. And then next week we'll get in to the next verse or next few weeks. We'll be, we'll be looking at this verse more. And, and folks, listen, I know this stuff's challenging. I know this stuff kicks your rear end. I know it. it. Kicks my rear end. Because what it does, it shows how imperfect I was as a parent. And who, how, imp you don't have to shake your head so well. I said, you're just, uh -huh, yep, yep. You could have been like, no, no, you, I said me. I didn't say we. And you're like, mm -hmm, yep, yep. Got to get an amen from the crowd. Wow. It shows how imperfect we were as parents and how imperfect I am as a husband. It shows these things, but it also shows once I understand the imperfections that there's a possibility and a hope that it can be corrected or worked on. See what I'm saying? There is no way near the cheer is perfect yet. Some of you are like, I thought you were talking about yourself. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? There's, there's hope. And parents, don't get discouraged, man. I, 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 I didn't yell at you. I just get excited. And, and, and I want you to know, don't, don't, don't quit. Don't, don't give up. Keep, keep fighting. Your kids are worth it. You'll know it. Because one day they'll give you grandkids. That's why you don't kill them when they're adolescents. That's the hope you take. Inside there somewhere is a kid that I'm really going to love. <laughs> you look at that when they're adolescents and you know what? You're going to make it through. Stay the course, baby. Stay the course. Let's pray. Father, you're an awesome, amazing God and we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your truth. And God, it's challenging. It's, it's hard. But yet, Lord... We see the results of when people, families, surrender their heart to you and before you. Lord, I pray for those here, those that are at home. 
that God, that there would be a spirit of hope that would well up. Yes, Lord, we've been dressed down a little bit today. But God, in that moment, in that time of, of being stripped away, I pray, Lord, that we reevaluate, get priorities, put them in right perspective with you. And that God, that families and lives would be strengthened by your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there's any here today that don't know you, or maybe at home that don't know you, that today, God, will be the day of their surrender and their, 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 their step of faith from this life into your life. With your heads bowed for just a moment, eye closed. We do this every week. If you want to accept Christ, you want to start your journey in faith, I want to pray for you. And how we do it, I stay here, you stay where you're at. And I'll ask you to look at me if you want me to pray for you. On my right, if you want a prayer this morning, just look at me right now. All I got to see is your eyes. Sure. Any more? Got them. My left. Got them. Pray this from your heart. Jesus, I come here to surrender, to give you my life, to give you my heart, to accept you and receive you. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you come into my life. You wash away my sin. Make me a brand new creation. Change my mind, change my heart, change my soul. I commit to you today in Jesus' name. Why don't you all stand? I'm going to close in prayer. If you'd like prayer this morning, if you'd like anointed, we got people up here that will anoint you with oil and pray for you. Uh, we do have Tuesday night prayer on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We'd love for you to come. Guys, if we could have some help cleaning up, we're a little short-handed today. I'd appreciate it. But let me close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for today. We thank you for the hope that you've given us through Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that as we go, that we can take this hope out into a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen.